Good afternoon. I am Frank Ackerblad, Chairman of EPO Sports Study Group. Warm welcome to this webinar on osteochondritis dissecans. This is the second of its kind after the trauma group webinar last month. EPOS has decided from this outbreak of the COVID pandemics to progress and accommodate this situation using web-based education. I wish here to acknowledge the hard work of EPOS e-learning task force. Sani Hiltunen, our precious education manager backstage today. And last but not least, our sponsor, Orthopediatrics, without whom this event would not happen. We have selected this important topic because this pathological condition affects a wide age range of patients from childhood to young adulthood. We commonly see those patients in our clinics. Several aspects of OCD remains debated, such as pathophysiology, imaging, and optimal management. The definition of this condition is an idiopathic alteration of subchondral bone, which can lead to separation of the bone fragment and adjacent articular osteoarthritis. We shall prefer the terms open or closed physis instead of juvenile or adult forms, those can be misleading. Today, we will give you some current concepts based on our own knowledge and experience and also a recent literature update. We wish that when you log out today, you will have your mind clear with guidelines for optimal management of our patients. Here is the program we have put together today, together with our panel. This is uh, very technically challenging indeed, because there will be seven speakers all together. So first, Marco Turati will talk about pathophysiology, epidemiology, and natural history of this disease. Then Monica Tusing from Lisbon, Portugal, we talk about physical examination and symptoms. Then I will give some information regarding instability concept and imaging. And then we'll move to the management, indication for treatment and results with Jean Cabral from Coimbra, Portugal, Manoj Ramachandran from London, UK, and Camille Thévenin Lemoine from Toulouse, France. Then we will also deal with specific location. Indeed, today we will use the medial femoral condyle as a model for the description, because this is the most common location of this pathological condition. But we will also talk about those specific location less common than the medial femoral condyle. Camille Thévenin Lemoine will talk about the lateral femoral condyle, patella and trochlea. Then Menage will talk about the femoral head location. Stéphane Tercier from Lausanne, Switzerland will talk about the talus and lateral humeral condyle. Then I will have the privilege to conclude and give you a take home message. And then last but not least, we will drive a question and answer session which I will uh, uh, try to make as interactive as possible, and I trust you all on this. I will now give the floor to Marco Turati for the pathophysiology, epidemiology, and natural history. Thank you, Frank. Um, Considering I have no disclosure with this presentation, considering epidemiology, uh, the incidence range between 2.3 and 31 cases on uh, 100,000 people. The incident peak uh, was between 13 and 17 years old with an higher risk in uh, older children and adolescents. 
boys have a fourfold increase in incidence compared with girls. However, female incidence is increasing in line with increased poor participation. Interracial difference in OCD is important, the higher risk in the blacks. Considering anatomical location in knee, 77 percentage of lesion affect the medial femoral condyle, in particular the lateral aspect of this one. 17 affect the lateral femoral condyle, 7 percentage affect the patella. The other location are rare, but bilateral uh, OCD location frequency was between 14 and 30 percent of patients. Considering etiology, the theory, etiological, there is not a defined etiological theory, but multifactorial theories. Mechanical and traumatic factors are important. Traumatic theory evolved from a single trauma theory to a repetitive microtrauma theory. And the subchondral stress reaction um, one moment, uh, probably interfere with bony trabecular healing in particular in immature knees, and this point can uh, lead to OCD development. Uh, mechanical factors are important. Spine, tibial spine impingement was proposed, in particular the medial femoral condyle, the classic OCD side. An MRI study confirmed that OCD patients have a more prominent tibial spine uh, than patients without OCD. Another study observed that smaller intercondylar notch wide was present in patients with OCD. Other anatomical variation like uh, alteration in PCL morphology as well, the presence of discoid meniscus was observed uh, in patients with OCD. Discoid meniscus uh, was linked in particular for lateral femoral condyle. Other mechanical factors are lower limb malalignment, in particular in frontal axial deviation and other biomechanical factors are obesity and instability. Also, knee activity-related position may have a role. Uh, yeah, uh, interesting study about young bas basketball players observed that catchers develop OCD at a younger age and in a more posterior location of the femoral condyle. This result may be the effect of repetitive and persistent loading of the knees in the hyperflexed position. Hereditary factors have a role. Uh, there is an increased incidence of OCD in monozygotic twins, and 40% of patients have a positive family history of OCD. Indeed, the mutation in candidate genes involved for the condyle metabolism have been implicated in this pathology. Also, local, local ischemia have a role. Anakin demonstrated that vascular anatomy of subchondral bone present poor arterial anastomosis and so an ischemic insult risk. And there is also biochemical factors. It was demonstrated that the low level of vitamin D are present in, in OCD patient. However, we don't know now actually the real role of these uh, factors. So we can state that such a joint morphology combined with local focal repeated trauma on this site with a unique vascular architecture may trigger ischemic events and subsequent OCD. Multicenter studies and rocks may will provide insight in the near future. Considering natural history, OCD can heal spontaneously or worsen over time. Open physis at younger age are associated with a higher percentage of healing with no treatment other than restrict sport activities. And if the lesion fails to heal, it became unstable. Uh, this event is a turning point in the course of OCD after which we, which osteoarthritis could develop if not well treated. Thank you. And now I'm turning over to Monica and uh, her presentation about symptoms and uh, physical examination. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. 
Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about the symptoms and the physical examination using the medial femoral candle as a model for the description. When do you have to become alert to watch out for an OCD? There is not a specific symptom and it can vary from asymptomatic, vague pain to severe pain with mechanical symptoms. It can affect any joint in the body, being the knee the most commonly affected joint. OCD occurs most often in children and adolescents aged 10 to 20, especially in those who are physically active and in young athletes, most often in boys than in girls. Sports that involve quick moves and fast changes in direction may increase that changes. Ongoing overuse, knee trauma, and repetitive unrecognized injuries can affect the subchondral bone. Normally, you see the children and adolescents with their parents, sometimes even with their coach in your consultation. The clinical history varies a lot, but can include, uh, can include decrease of performance, and a change in the gait and running pattern due to stiffness or pain that the patient and parents com complain about. Here you have a boy um, that is 11 years old. Um, you apparently don't notice a, a big complication on the right side, uh, but the parents um, refer that when he walks a bit more, he gets worse. I don't know if you can see this video. When he runs, um, you see a, a vulgus deviation and rotation of the right knee to decrease the pressure of the uh, lesion. But the most common complaint is pain in 80% um, of the cases. Pain is not mentally correlated to the state of the OCD. In an early state, there can um, be pain without significant alteration in the X-ray, but an MRI can already show edema of the subchondral bone. Pain can be triggered by physical activity to the repetitive stress to the subchondral bone, such as sports, playing, but also common things like walking upstairs and uh, a hill. Swelling of the joint and feeling of stiffness after resting are further possible signs. The joint might lock in any position. Um, uh, if a loose or loosening fragment gets caught between bones, or there can be a clicking sound when moving the joint. Inability to fully extend the leg, more likely to happen if there is already a detached bone or cartilage that drifts into the joint space. Depending on the chronicity, chronicity of the uh, lesion, patients may report perceptive dysfunction and intermittent uh, knee instability. Um, the physical examination with the medial femoral condyle as a model for the description. Um, the diagnosis of the OCD of the knee depends both um, on the physical exam and on the imaging, uh, imaging studies. When thinking about the OCD, have in mind which age your child uh, has and where OCD of the knee occurs. Ask the family for the family history, look for the knee alignment. Um, the most common location for the OCD to occur in the knee is the medial femoral condyle. Um, being the la lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle the most affected, as in this X-ray, you can, can see um, in this X-ray, no, in this um, MRI image, that you can see the location in PA and here in the lateral view. Um, I have here an image of a, a knee and um, I just, um, you, of where my finger is pointed on, there's the spot when you can palpate um, the, the, the pain. Other places include the lateral femoral condyle where it can be quite large and take more time to heal, heal the trochlea and the patella. One of the most important prognostic factors of OCD is whether the pain the patient's growth plates are still open, meaning the younger the patient, the better the prognostic um, for the full recovery with conservative treatment. Higher stages of disease have a worse outcome. Location of the lesion also matters, as patients with OCD of the lateral condyle or patella have a lower rate of full recovery. Of those patients who have open growth plates and the OCD lesion has not partially or completely detached, there is a chance 
that it can heal with conservative uh, treatment. For those patients who have a symptomatic OCD and the growth plates are closed, the outcomes are not as good, the symptoms can continue to worsen, and so surgical treatment may be indicated. Examining, um, for example, the uh, uh, left knee while palpating the lateral article joint line, you can cause pain to, to the lateral condyle at OCD, but also due to the medial condyle OCD, because while palpating, palpating from the lateral article joint line to the inner side, in the oblique direction, you make, you make force, I will, you make force towards the lateral side of the medial condyle, and um, it will go right into the spot of the, um, on the OCD. Then you will have swelling to the unstable OCD. And while testing mobility, lo uh, look out for crepitation. There can be a clicking sound when moving the joint or locking of the joint due to the loosening or an already loosened fragment. Inability to fully expand, uh, extend or flex the knee due to pain, swelling, or trapped unstable uh, fragment. The medial femoral condyle being the most common location of OCD in the knee, getting stressed to the condyle and rotating to, towards the condyle lateral side will cause pain to the lesion. This is how the Wilson test um, that is used to help detect the presence of OCD uh, works. So this test is uh, confirmed as followed. Um, sit your patient on a table, um, bend the knee to um, about 90 degrees of angle, take the patient's foot and rotate it internally, and then um, ask the patient to stretch and extend the, uh, the leg. If it doesn't hurt, it's okay. The test is positively when the patient reports pain in the knee about 30 uh, uh, degrees from full extension. While derotating the knee and rotating it um, externally um, like this, and when it uh, stops hurting, then the test is positive. So far, no studies have done, um, been done about the validity of this test but um, none of these tests is specific, so you need to complete the diagnosis with further radiology tests. Thank you very much. I will now pass back to Frank, who will talk about imaging and stability concepts and future. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much, Monica. We're now going to talk about imaging and also, very important, the instability concept and also criteria for the diagnosis of instability because the management we will see depends on this instability. Imaging always starts with plain X rays, AP and lateral. Notch view is useful for those posteriorly located lesions and the skyline view for location affecting the trochlea or the kneecap. You must bear in mind that this condition is bilateral in about 15% of cases. So if the patient does complain of the contralateral side, it's certainly worth getting an X-ray. Those two classifications are uh, only relevant for research purpose on AP and uh, lateral view. It can be anterior, uh, middle segment, or posteriorly locate, located, and then on AP from one to five, from medial to lateral. I like to use uh, uh, the soft coat, the French Orthopedic uh, uh, Association uh, classification. Uh, because it's quite uh, sim simple. The staging goes from one to three. One is just a, a lucent uh, area represented here. Two is a nodular and three is nodular but displaced in relation to the surrounding epiphysis. Radiograph can also bring uh, further information the physical status, in this example, the patient is very close to skeletal maturity. 
the volume of the progeny of the lesion itself here it's actually huge on the lateral condyle and also to check for early signs of osteo osteoarthritis and this was the case here we come to the mri mri has become the mainstay for uh, diagnosis but also for staging of this peculiar condition in my practice this is non-systematic I order an MRI for those uh, high volume lesion in all skeletally mature individuals and in girls older than 11 and boys older than 13. Because before this age, uh, no uh, case of instability have been reported according to this paper. And of course, uh, uh, we should order an MRI for uh, persisting symptoms after three to six months of non-operative treatment, which will be described by Jean. Here are uh, some, uh, some uh, classical uh, features. In a, a T1 sequence here, you can see uh, the low signal uh, progeny. On a T2 uh, weighted fat, fat suppressed, you can see here the heterogeneous uh, signal together with uh, a surrounding uh, parent bone hypersignal representing edema. Here again, uh, same sequence, the progeny protrudes beyond the epiphyseal contours and the articular cartilage is uh, uh, clearly interrupted with some synovial fluid uh, going through. We come to uh, this uh, very important sign here same sequence uh, this is an hyper intense signal which is sandwiched between two low signal bands and this one is uh, famous to be the oreo cookie sign and this is a sign of instability and we will come later to this you should be aware of what is not ocd irregular ossification of the condyles is a differential you usually find such an image before the age of six years. In this case, there is no edema. The, the abnormal signal is never extended to the intercondylar notch, and it's typically posteriorly located, uh, as you can see here. And obviously, the patient is asymptomatic and could or could complain of a, a pain of a different origin than OCD. Peter Fabricant, together uh, with the Rock uh, Study Group in North America, recently warned us about the relatively poor inter-rater reliability of those MRI signs. We should bear this in mind. This was a very important paper published very recently in uh, uh, AGSM. Now we come to the instability criteria. The reference paper is uh, this one from Dusmet and colleagues. Those criteria, there are four, high signal intensity line beneath the lesion, a cystic area beneath the lesion, high signal intensity line going through the articular cartilage, and a focal articular defect. This was done with the arthroscopic examination and palpation as a gold standard. Instability from an arthroscopic point of view is when the articular cartilage is, is discontinued and or when the fragment is ballotable using the, the, the probe. For those patients with open physis, skeletally immature, the sensitivity is very high, 100%, but the specificity was poor, only 11%, according to Kijowski and colleagues in radiology. For this reason, those authors have described secondary criteria, high T2 signal intensity surrounding rim, with the same signal as the surrounding synovial fluid, a second outer rim of low T2 signal intensity, multiple breaks in the subchondral bone plate, and also surrounding cysts, multiple or above 5 mm in diameter. Using these secondary criteria, the specificity is up to 100% uh, 
in skeletally immature patients uh, with whom we deal uh, uh, usually with. Here is a case example of a, a 13 year old girl with a 12 month history of pain and a six months of uh, sports restriction. You can see on this uh, coronal T2 uh, uh, fat suppressed that we have the uh, uh, Oreo sign which I described earlier and the articular cartilage is interrupted. We have also a cyst uh, in the parent bone. For this reason, this is an unstable OCD. Here is the arthroscopic inspection of the same patient. You can see that uh, uh, there is the classical uh, uh, wrinkle in the rug sign according to the uh, uh, rock classification, but the fragment is not balotable. The cartilage is not uh, interrupted, there is no cleft. After the harvest uh, uh, of uh, the, the donor site and also before the graft on the, on the uh, OCD, you can see clearly the delimitation between the progeny and the parent bone. And when we pull with the probe, we can see that we, we can actually move uh, the fragment. So here, we can tell that the MRI is probably superior to arthroscopy in the sense that it shows instability earlier than arthroscopy. In my practice, I would rather rely on the MRI for decision making than only arthroscopy. What I, I would like uh, to uh, take home uh, regarding this particular uh, topic is that the diagnosis is, is uh, on plain radiograph is enough. MRI is not systematic, even though this is the mainstay. Be aware of uh, the instability concept. This is clearly the critical turning point. And MRI provides earlier detection of instability. Thank you very much. And now I will hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so now we move on to treatment indications and results uh, regarding conservative treatment. Um, the goals of treatment are to, to promote healing of the subchondral bone, uh, to prevent chondral collapse, subsequent fractures, uh, osteochondral defect formation, and early joint uh, degeneration. The conservative treatment should be the primary approach for stable OCD uh, lesions of the knee. Uh, we should give at least three to six months before uh, the decision of a surgical treatment of operating of a operating patient. And, and there are several uh, phases and options for uh, conservative treatment. Uh, immobilization, limited weight bearing, active restrictions. Um, there's also controversy, um, lack of uh, consensus of evidence uh, regarding the duration and timing of these interventions. So um, I personally use the three-phase non-operative management protocol described by Cocker. Uh, the first phase uh, will include knee immobilization for uh, four to six weeks with crutch-protected partial weight-bearing gait. I usually immobilize them in a cylinder cast with knee flexion so that the patient uh, cannot uh, weight bear with his uh, feet. Uh, at the end of this period, the child should be pain-free and repeat uh, radiographs afterwards. The second phase after immobilization, um, the weight bearing will be tolerated without immobilization. Uh, it will, they will start a, re a rehab program, uh, but Sport activities and uh, repetitive uh, impact activities uh, may still be restricted. Uh, if we, um, if there's already a, a radiograph or clinical signs of healing, it will be at three to four months. And at this point, like this example I show you, uh, we can see here uh, the, the lesion after immobilization and four months after immobilization, 
the patient is pain-free and we can see signs of recovering in the x-ray and so at this point we can move on to the third phase which includes supervised initiation of running jumping a gradual return to sports with um, increased intensity um, and like uh, this example at the, the red we can see in the left the initial lesion and then after uh, 10 months of uh, conservative treatment we can see uh, a normal um, x-ray with the condyle completely uh, healed so the results approximately uh, 50 to 67 percent of ocd uh, lesions will he heal in 6 to 12 months uh, with non-operative treatment and so they will not require surgery uh, but in atypical locations such as lateral femoral condyle or patellofemoral uh, locations they're more likely to be unstable and so um, they're more likely not to, to pro, uh, progress with the conservative treatment. And so also other authors have, present, uh, have reported that uh, symptoms of effusion or mechanical features, larger lesion sizes and uh, the presence of extended sublesion sclerosis on x-ray are predictive of non-healing at six months. So we can conclude that conservative treatment should be the first line treatment uh, for stable lesions and the return to full activity is allowed after complete reassification demonstrated on x-ray. Now we, we move on to our first line of uh, surgical treatment, perforations. Um, so the, the goals of surgical treatment um, is uh, in, in uh, st stable uh, lesions that do not respond to initial course of non-operative treatment and to treat unstable lesions. So for symptomatic and stable OCD lesions that fail conservative treatment, uh, we do perforations. If the lesion is unstable, we can fix, we can try and fix the fragment. Uh, if the lesion is detached, we can opt for osteochondral grafts. We will see these after. Uh, arthroscopy uh, is the main method used to treat surgically these patients, this uh, pathology. Um, initially, we do a diagnostic uh, uh, arthroscopy to assess instability, like Professor Akadlet said. However, the use of MRI is mandatory given its greater uh, sensibility. So we have to complement these two um these two exams the mri and our arthroscopic assessment um, perforation is thought to disrupt the sclerotic margin of the lesion and promote healing via growth factors that will be released from the healthy underlying cancellous bone to the uh, lesion site and so after confirming um, arthroscopically that our lesion is stable we can drill either transarticular or Heteroarticularly. From a transarticular drilling um, technique, this uh, first we identify the, um, the greenish and yellowish color, as we can see here in this example, the, the demarcation, the softer consistency uh, using the probe, um, and then we using a small K wire from 1.2 to 1.5 millimeters at low speed power drill. Uh, we do several drill holes in the lesion um, using between the anterolateral medial and the anterolateral arthroscopic portals. Postoperatively, these patients uh, are maintained with, uh, uh, without weight bearing uh, for four to six weeks, and sports activities will be resumed after three to six months, depending on their postoperative course and their x rays. Um, these, uh, like every technique, uh, has some drawbacks. Uh, the main drawbacks are that we, we violate the normal surface cartilage and we are uncertain of the long-term implications of these uh, small uh, surface damages. Uh, we don't actually see the key wires passing through the, the entire lesion. And um, for those far posterior condylar lesions, this may be difficult to access. The retroarticular drilling um, involves inserting a pin into the, the epiphysis under fluoroscopic guidance, like you can see here. 
um, without, without uh, entering the joint cavity, without damaging the cartilage. So like in this example I give you, uh, we use a freehand technique below the physis, so we won't damage the physis. Uh, we can be checking in uh, arthroscopically to see the, the articular surface and we aim the pin towards the, the lesion. Then we use multiple K wires because our first K wire will guide the positioning of the second K wire and so on. Um, it's important to check with the fluoroscopy in AP view and at least in uh, lateral view the position of our uh, pins because we want them to be uh, in the lesion site and without damaging cartilage or physis. The post-op uh, treatment is the same as the transarticular drilling, weight bearing for four to six weeks and uh, resume sports activities at uh, three, four to six months, depending on the course and on the x-ray. Like we can see in this example of a patient of mine, uh, it's a 12-year-old boy uh, that failed conservative treatment. And so we, the lesion, uh, we, we check the lesion, it was stable. We did perforation, retro, retro articular drilling fashion. And then at six months, he's already pain-free uh, with no functional impairment. And we can see a, a big improve in the X-ray. And so at, uh, at 15 months, the X-ray is uh, uh, completely, we can see the lesion completely healed. So uh, the, he, he has, from this day on, he has no more uh, sport restrictions. Um, this technique spares articular surface and physis, uh, but also has some drawbacks. Uh, the main ones are uh, incomplete, uh, technical, it's technical more challenging. It can require a longer operative time and it requires radiation exposure. Um, what concern, in what concerns results, we have uh, higher rates of healing with low complication rates uh, reported using either transarticular and retroarticular drilling modalities. So surgical treatment for stable lesions with intact articular cartilage involves perforation, drilling at subchondral bone, uh, aiming to stimulate vascular growth and subchondral bone healing. Thank you. Now I will pass to Dr. Manoj, who will talk about um, who will talk about fixation. Okay, um, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Joel. So um, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about fixation. I only have five minutes, so we'll cover as much as possible. Um, we've looked at why you would um, intervene in an OCD, and essentially it's based on MRI and operative findings. Um, Frank has already mentioned um, some of the uh, imaging um, factors, such as how you decide instability, but an unstable fragment and particularly a fragment that has a normal surface cartilage with a layer of subchondral bone is very amenable to fixation. Obviously, we have to consider um, the age. Uh, the younger do better anyway. The state of the physis, an open physis uh, patients do better. And the size of the lesion, there are lots of papers on it, uh, but somewhere around 240 uh, millimeters squared is the size of the lesion, is a sort of cutoff point. Um, uh, but that varies and it, it'll be in your practice when you decide what to do. Um, and then you could decide whether you're going to do this arthroscopically or using an arthrotomy and that's completely up to what you're comfortable doing and where the lesion is. And intraoperatively you look at the status of the of the lesion, particular surface of the cartilage and decide whether it's amenable to fixation or not. There are a lot of fixation devices available. Uh, the first sort of good description is a case series from Smiley in 1957 in the general bone joint surgery using screw and uh, and nails. Uh, but now there are multiple options available. We don't use staples much anymore, but the choice is really between metallic screws and bioabsorbable uh, pins or screws. The metallic screws can be headed or headless uh, compression, and the bioabsorbable devices can be uh, pins or, or screws which, which compress. Um, and the basic uh, decision you have to make is uh, how comfortable you are with using one or the other. With a metal, you get obviously much more strength, but it interferes with the postoperative MRI 
and particularly if it's a headed screw, you might need to remove it because it could damage the kissing cartilage. Um, but at the time you remove it, you, you could have a second look. So it allows you to reassess, but then you need a second operation. With bioabsorbable pins or screws, there's no interference with MRI. There's no need for removal. Um, but bioabsorbable uh, breakdown products, these products are made from things like polylactic acid, polyglycolic acid, which break down into lactic and glycolic acid breakdown products, which can cause cysts, synovitis, a chronic fusion. And because they're not that strong, uh, they can break. So you have to be very careful when you're putting them in. Um, so you have to be comfortable with that technique too, but there is a tendency towards using bioabsorbable devices. Uh, operatively, um, it depends on whether you're doing an arthroscopy and arthrotomy, but some of the principles to remember are uh, it's important to do a complete debridement of the fibrous tissue uh, at the base uh, where the overlying the underlying uh, subchondral bone and that encourages healing. And if you're going to put uh, a lesion back on and there's subchondral bone loss, you don't want the, the fixation to sink. So to stop subsidence, you might need to put a bone graft in and you can harvest that locally from the tibial metaphysis, for example. You can use osteochondral plug, plugs, that's a biological fixation rather than screw or, or, or bioabsorbable devices. Um, and you can harvest that from a non-weight bearing area of the intercondylar notch and fit the number and, and size accordingly. So you can put one or two, which are six to eight millimeters in diameter and about 15 millimeters in depth and, and fill your area up. You could add an additional screw as in the bottom diagram and that's called a hybrid fixation. And that's particularly use, useful in, in larger, older, children that need more uh, strength in the, in the fixation. So there are many ways to do it and ultimately you've got to choose what you want to do and if you look at the literature as, as with most of pediatric orthopedics the, there are lots of case series and cohorts obviously there aren't any randomized controlled trials so uh, the best systematic review is from uh, Mo Bandari's group in Hamilton Ontario who are very good at doing systematic reviews but that was back in 2014 so it's probably time for a new one looking at all the papers that are out there, and there haven't been that many more individual papers since, um, but that looked at every single fixation device plus technique that you might use to fix OCDs, including metal screws, biosorbal pins, biosorbal screws, and osteochondral plugs. And ultimately, there's no point going through each of these because whether you look at uh, results in terms of radiological or clinical outcomes, um, they are all pretty much more much. They're all pretty good. And because there are no controls, so you don't have a, a group that you didn't do something to, um, the end result is always pretty good. But generally, the most common technique you will use when you're fixing uh, is likely to be a bioabsorbable pin fixation because that's that, that's the most number of case series in the literature. Um, but you should be comfortable with what you're doing. You can fix it any way you like uh, as long as you do follow those patients up and, and stick to the protocol that, that you've established in your department. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to, to Camille, the next bit. Thank you, Manoj. Sorry. So my first talk is about reconstruction. Uh, so, uh, reconstruction are indicated when fixation is not possible. First step is evaluation of location, surface, and depth of the defect. That has to be done uh, using both MRI and arthroscopy that are complementary. Remember that arthroscopy is just a tool. The main goal is to get a good congruence. On the left uh, images, you will see a, a osteochondral uh, fragment that has been fixed, but without grafting the subchondral bone. So, uh, so it is uh, um, healed in a subsided position. And so the condyle is too flat. The uh, congruence is not restored. And that explains why the patient still has pain. And on the right side, you see an, an obvious two protruding osteochondral plug. And you can easily imagine why the patient still has pain. For severe cases, severe cases, you may add an axis correction using osteotomy or growth modulation. The first technique I will uh, talk about is microfracture. Uh, so it is a simple uh, technique. You perforate the skeletal bone uh, using a drill or a spike. Uh, the uh, objective is that there is uh, blood uh, inflow 
that will create a thermal tissue that will take place to the cartilage. It gives good short-term results, but that deteriorate over time. So this technique is only indic indicated for uh, non-weight-bearing location and for small lesion under one centimeter square. An evolution of this technique is a mic where you add to the microfracture a considerable graft and uh, you, a coverage with a collagen membrane. But uh, in the literature, uh, this technique gives the uh, same results as a uh, microfracture alone. Mosaic plasticity uh, uh, is probably uh, the best way to uh, reconstruct a small, um, small defect. Uh, so we harvest. Uh, osteochondral plug usually in from the peripheral cochlea. Uh, the limit is donocyte mobility, and it may be difficult to uh, to get a good congruence. When the uh, lesion is small, you can do it uh, with an audio. But when the director is small, it might be when you put multiple tags. Uh, it, uh, it is very difficult to do it from You see on the right corner the good congruence and the good iteration of the graft. For bigger defects, uh, you can use mega oats, so that is a massive osteochondral uh, plug uh, harvested on the posterior condyle or uh, on an allograft. You see on this MRI the good the integration of the, uh, of the graft. And the defect on the posterior part of the condyle where the graft has been harvested. Finally, chondrocyte graft. Uh, it is a two step procedure. First, harvesting of chondrocyte, usually using arthroscopy. Uh, it can come from the fragment that is too damaged to be uh, fixed or from a cartilage in a non weight bearing zone. And then uh, you put the chondrocyte for culture, and uh, you can graft them two or three weeks after. Uh, so uh, the first step for this second procedure is to fill the gap with bone, uh, bone graft, then uh, put the cartilage and cover it with a collagen uh, membrane. So you can use this defect for this technique for very large defect. Uh, you have to notice that in this technique, uh, you can uh, you, you put cartilage only on uh, bone graft. That means that when uh, you find a piece of cartilage that has no remaining bone on it, you can fix it because it will heal. Uh, so you have to uh, well remove the uh, sclerotic bone. What I usually do is that I um, harvest uh, osteochondral plug and through the holes, I will harvest um, uh, the considered bone that will fill the gap, then cover uh, with the uh, cartilage uh, and fix it with a screw. And I add the two plugs that will act as an activator for healing. So my take home messages for uh, this part is that remember that congruence is the goal. It's not a big deal to do an arthrotomy. Uh, Osteochondritis, the second is a subchondral bone disease, and I think that uh, most um, uh, the major part of failure are due to uh, a bad, uh, bad treatment of succumbal bone uh, and fix every part of cancer as you can, uh, it will heal in children. Uh, I will go on with the uh, other specific location and uh, I will talk about other knee location. Uh, so uh, first is the lateral femoral condyle. Uh, it's very, uh, very frequently associated to discoid meniscus, up to 90% uh, cases in the literature. Uh, it's almost always in zone C, it's a posterior part. When it is complete discoid meniscus, it's mainly on the uh, axial part of the condyle, and when it is incomplete, mainly on the peripheral part. Uh, as for medial femoral condyle, we can also have uh, impingement with the prominent tibial spine. 
uh, conservative treatment is usually efficient and bad results factor are discoid meniscus and delayed diagnosis. So we can also have osteochondritis on the patella. It's strongly related to micro trauma, uh, sport activities. Uh, it's usually small lesions that have a good possibility to heal by itself. It may last uh, a little, so uh, to do surgery with development in drilling will give the same result, but probably quicker. Mosaic plasty has been described, but uh, as it is small lesion, uh, it's uh, very uncommon to use this technique. Trochlea is also a quite uncommon location, uh, more uh, frequently lateral than medial, related to sports activities. And uh, tibia is uh, the more common uh, location, and uh, we see also associated to other lesion, in this case, meniscal lesion, and here uh, in uh, agenesia of cruciate ligaments. And also for this location, conservative, conservative treatment is very efficient. So my take-home message is for this, uh, this part is that uh, we find um, micro trauma uh, in uh, almost uh, all the cases for this other knee location and conservative, conservative treatment is uh, almost you know, effective in almost cases. Uh, so I will uh, I will give back uh, the floor to Manoj. We talk about femoral head location. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. So um, I've got three minutes. I'm just going to talk about the basics of, of femoral head osteochondral uh, chondritis desiccans. It's extremely rare. Uh, to be honest, uh, if we talk about acetabular OCDs and those are so rare, there's only a few case reports. Uh, OCDs of the femoral head are, are less rare, but still there's only less than 100 uh, reports in the pediatric literature. Um, the primary OCDs that we, we uh, pick up, um, we're not really sure whether they're a, a variant of avascular necrosis or whether they're a true osteochondritis discans or not, because if you look at many of the reports, the, the lesions that they show tend to be quite extensive with some epiphyseal distortion, sometimes coxa magna, almost looks like a, a, a perthase-like disease. So you wonder whether it is a primary condition or not. Secondary OCDs are reported, uh, many reports, particularly in perthase disease, but also in things like skeletal dysplasias and, and DDH. So when we look at primary OCDs of the femoral head, we have to exclude underlying causes. Once we do that, there are very, very few papers, less than 10. There's no specific clinical presentation. It's essentially pain, limp, and a decreased range of motion, particularly rotation. Uh, the standard imaging is plain films followed by uh, advanced imaging such as MR or CT and you can treat it non-operatively and that's with activity limitation just like in the knee with for three to six months you can excise the fragment drill it uh, whether that's transarticular or retroarticular uh, you can do uh, osteochondral autologous transfers um, and you can fix either arthroscopically open but but the numbers are small and it's quite difficult to pick out cases so I'm, I'm going to just show you a case from exactly 10 years ago this was July 2010 so a 14 year old boy who was the British uh, junior fencing champion and wanted to go to the Olympics and he was lunging during uh, a, a bout of fencing and suddenly had a pain in his right groin and this carried on for a while he had physio for around four months and he did not get better and this is what his imaging showed it's a stable uh, lesion uh, and arthroscopically, uh, most of the femoral head looked nice, but if you look at the bottom image, um, there's sort of a softening and, and fibrillation over a specific area of his femoral head. And he underwent went orthoscopic assisted uh, retroarticular uh, drilling. And over a course of around uh, 18 months, he, he settled down. And in fact, he was due to go as the Brit current British fencing champion to Olympics this year in July 2020. Uh, hopefully he'll go next year. Um, but, you know, he, he may have got better by just rest alone or by some other technique and there are no controls. So these are very rare conditions. Um, secondary OCDs can be in many conditions, but most commonly it's reported in Perthes disease. Two to seven percent of Perthes disease can end up with an osteochondral defect. Uh, the most is asymptomatic, but if you get a loose body uh, that and results in instability, you can end up with locking, catching, snapping. And most often you tend to do something like an arthroscopic removal, like in the bottom image there. Uh, you can drill the bed, um, you can also do for larger um, lesions, but this is mostly described in the adult literature, um, oste uh, osteochondral autologous transfers and open fixations with, with, for example, headless screws. 
But in conditions like Perthes disease, you must address the other multiple joint abnormalities in the femoral head and acetabulum. This is not a single uh, condition. Uh, the biggest uh, series and the most comprehensively followed up is a, a set of only seven patients, uh, but this is from St. Louis, Missouri, from Shone uh, Perry Schoenecker and John Clahusi's group, um, where they opened it up using surgical dislocation and fixed it um, with headless compression screws and had good radiological and clinical outcomes at around a five-year follow-up. But these are still, again, only case series. So the take-home messages for osteochondritis, this cancer, femoral head, are they're rare, there's insufficient literature for natural history, etiology, prognosis, and management. There can be primary or secondary, particularly in birthdays, and it's mostly non-operative, but occasionally surgery might be necessary. Thank you very much. Hand over. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to, to like you to to, to quickly present you the third and for uh, and second most frequent location of OCD. And first, let's talk about uh, Talar Dome uh, OCD. The, it's the third more, most uh, frequent location. Um, sorry. Okay. Go back. Can go back. I will go back. Um, oh few time it's the third most frequent location of OCD and uh, may be caused by traumatic events for uh, lateral lesion and repetitive microtrauma for medial lesion as uh, in gymnastic or figure skating and already said with uh, regional vascular compromise or genetic uh, predisposition 10 to 25 percent are bilateral um, the medial lesion is more uh, more an OCD specific lesion with uh, no acute trauma, which is more common, more posterior, larger and deeper. And the lateral lesion is uh, more an osteochondral lesion and happens uh, more frequently after trauma. It is more superficial and smaller, more central and anterior, as you see in the picture, and more often displaced and symptomatic. Um, the presentation is a typical history of ankle uh, inversion injury that does not improve with typical conservative treatment. And the symptoms are pain, swelling, and mechanical sens sensation like popping, clicking, and locking. And with advanced lesion, a loose body sensation could happen. Imagine we'll start uh, with standard X-ray uh, with uh, 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 AP and lateral view of ankle in weight bearing. And uh, remember that initial radiographs are normal in a third of the cases. Uh, MRI is allowed to clarify, uh, classify sorry, the lesion uh, in five stages, as uh, done by he Heppels in uh, 99. And the treatment uh, will be conservative with immobilization and non weight bearing for grade one and two at very young age and for a small lesion. Uh, surgical indication, mainly uh, arthroscopy, uh, are proposed for grade 1 and 2A, uh, still symptomatic after uh, three months of proper treatment, and for grade 2B to 5, uh, and in case of uh, a loose body. The surgery, surgery uh, and the surgical treatment will depend on of intraoperative uh, feeding. Uh, it could be loose body removal, debridement, and bone marrow stimulation. It's always the same, securing or fixing a lesion, and development or replacement of yelling cartilage as uh, um, may see or AC. A clinical case with a girl of 11 years old uh, with uh, left ankle grade 2A with a symptomatic, uh, uh, still symptomatic after four months with proper conservative treatment. You can see the X-ray and the MRI, and the and she had an arthroscopy with a uh, uh, lesion location and inspection of the cartilage, transtalar drilling and the fluoroscopy control using palpation hook as a target and the uh, results uh, at one two and three year post-operative are very good you can see the bone uh, healing in this uh, ct scanner at three uh, years after the the surgery 
usual re rehabilitation should be done and uh, full return to sports activities is usually possible after four to six months. So in uh, the next five minutes, I want to uh, go on lateral humeral condyle. And um, first, uh, please don't misdiagnose because uh, if you have a child less than 10 years old with pain and swelling and uh, X-ray with irregular ossification, uh, it is firstly a Panner's disease and has a beginning self-limiting course and with symptomatic treatment. The real uh, OCD of the capitalum is present in uh, the above 10 years old uh, children and mainly adolescents, more by uh, boys than girls. Uh, you can see pain, swelling, and movement restriction with a loss of extension, which is different from uh, the Panner's disease, who has no uh, movement restriction. This is the second most frequent location for OCD, and you can see the second is only 6%. It's mainly on the dominant arm, who after repetitive overhead and upper extremity weight-bearing activities, uh, as a gymnastic or throwing discipline, uh, I see in Switzerland also for the ice hockey player. And uh, as told Frank, uh, the open five this OCDR had a better prognosis than the, the closed uh, um, physics. The anatomy, as a reminder, capitalum has a vascular supply by two end arteries, by the recurrent and the interosseous recurrent uh, artery. And the imaging will be done by a standard X-ray, lateral and AP view of the elbow. And uh, uh, the, the MRI is uh, the most useful for assessing the size, extent of the edema in the, in the, in the lateral condyle and the cartilage status. The classification, uh, uh, we will use the modified Takahara by Kolmodin. Uh, it is mainly based on the location of the lesion, as seen on this picture, with the two 3A and 3B, the different position of the lesion in uh, the la lateral condyle. The treatment uh, uh, is non-operative uh, if the fragment is stable, and we will get uh, more than 90% of Success. The pronostic the prognosis, sorry, is uh, that the majority of healing will be happen between six to uh, eighteen months. So it's very long to wait for some uh, sports people, young uh, young athletes. As for the location, uh, the other location, the the treatment could be surgical with arthroscopic microfractural leading, treating arthroscopic fixation or the debridement and loose body excision and sometimes you can use holds for a large tip two or three lesion. Uh, complication are uh, frequent because up to 50% develop arthritic change as long-term. And uh, some of these uh, uh, young athletes uh, are unable to return to sports at the same level after the treatment. And uh, I will show you a clinical case with a 16 years old boxing guy who has a left elbow pain for a long time. He had an uh, MRI, who can see the loose body uh, in, the, in the left uh, picture. And he had uh, an arthroscopy with uh, removal of two foreign body and microfracture. And you can see the start of healing five months for postoperatively. And the last case, finally, I want to show you a young girl. Uh, um, who had an arthroscopy for uh, showing, uh, like here, a type 2 with uh, unstable fragment. You can see here the unstable fragment is uh, a big one. OK. And so we will remove it by uh, arthroscopy. Uh, it takes some time. We can do by the shiver and some time we use the mechanical uh, uh, position. At the end, we made it 
we made her um, a micro fracture you can do easily in this uh, location and I will giving the microphone back to Frank for the conclusion of uh, this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Stefani. It's uh, it's time to wrap up. Uh, please uh, bear with us for the questions and answer session after this quick conclusion. A few take home messages. In skeletally immature individual, the first move, the first treatment is three to six months spot restriction. Please remember the MRI features for instability. The first step of operative treatment is arthroscopy. It will give you a lot of information, including inspection and probing. And then, when necessary, you can shift to an open treatment when necessary. Perforations provide excellent clinical results in stable OCDs. So please don't miss the, the time to uh, give the patient perforation. And remember, all the patients should be observed until healed according to the radiograph and not only asymptomatic patients. We have this review article available for those interested. This is open access. And if you want to ask questions, this is my email address. So I shall remind you or tell you that there will be an evaluation form uh, uh, sent to you, you, all the participants uh, within a couple of days and together with the link to get the replay of this uh, webinar. Now we will move to the question and answer uh, session. And uh, we had a, a lot of questions already, and I, I thank all the participants for that. So the, the first uh, question will be uh, to Jean. Uh, Jean, uh, is there an evidence that eye mobilization is useful as compared to sports restriction only, according to the literature and your experience as well? There are uh, no evidence and there are uh, no consensus about timing for immobilization, uh, for sports restriction time. Um, so um, in my uh, point of view, and I think uh, a lot of, of people, uh, when, you, when you have a patient uh, that is reporting mild symptoms for uh, a long period of time and um, you have a clinical uh, exam uh, supporting uh, a, a suspecting of uh, OCD and you have uh, an x-ray image um, I uh, I will start doing um, immobilization I will do a cylinder cast in a flexed uh, knee position uh, so the patient won't uh, be able to um, to bear weight in that limb so I will start uh, doing that because I think uh, if we just stop um, sports, um, we know that children are uh, like uh, sportive uh, uh, humans uh, because they are always jumping, uh, uh, running. So if you stop uh, the football activity, in the between classes, they will be practicing uh, sport with their uh, uh, friends, they will be jumping, they will be kicking, uh, doing everything. So if you don't, I, I think if I act quickly, um, I think I will uh, be gaining time in the treatment procedure. Thank you, Jean. Uh, the next question is to Menage regarding fixation. So the question was, is compression necessary? Uh, thank you. Um, that, that's that's an interesting question. So um, the biocompression screws and, and the met metallic compression screws are all made to compress. Um, ideally, you know, if, if you've got to treat it as a fracture and get as stable a fixation as possible, what you have no control of is how much compression you're you're applying as you twist the screw. Um, you know, every manufactured screw gives you 
in, according to the manufacturer's instructions, a certain level of depth that you sink it into. But that doesn't tell you exactly how much compression you provided. But so I can't give you a direct answer to that. All I can say is a level of compression is needed. How much is enough? Don't know. Uh, but a certain level of compression is only necessary to give you stability. Okay, uh, as you uh, as you mentioned, it can be compared uh, to a fracture situation. I, I think it does make sense to try to yes. give some compression as much as possible, but at the same time, you don't want the head of your screw going through the cartilage. So th that's a bit tricky uh, there. Well, this is at least my experience. Yeah, I agree. And um, uh, I will move to the next question regarding fixation when you use a uh, uh, metal. Uh, when do you remove the screw if if you remove the screw and or, or not tell me so I, I don't i don't use metal i use biocompression screws i use um oh. resorbable screws only yeah so i very rarely use metal if we do use metal for whatever reason it's it's a very large fragment of a much older child then it's at least six months down the line but i've got to be convinced that it's uh that healing has completely occurred um, so that's that's done at the six month arthroscopy look, but it's it's unusual for me to use uh, metallic screws unless I've got nothing else available. What's okay. your what's your what's uh, your experience, uh, Frank? Well, my my preference is uh, uh, achieving fixation using uh, osteochondral plugs with, with the oats uh, ancillary as as I tried uh, to show you in my video. Uh, this is my favorite fixation type because it's, it's only biologic. Uh, uh, no need for removal, and it brings uh, fresh bone uh, into the lesion site. Um, but sometimes uh, this is not stable enough, and I need to combine with metal, and then uh, I use uh, regular screws uh, with uh, early removal at uh, three months of time, and then uh, I do a, a second look uh, uh, arthroscopy just to check that uh, the cartilage is healed, and then I remove the screw. That's my... I mean, uh, yeah, that's, that's very interesting because um... I mean, it's available in the UK. It's not widely practiced in the UK, so um, it, it's not something that's as commonly done uh, as it is, I suppose, in your practice. Even though we have all the equipment available and various companies make the devices like Arthrex, et cetera, um, it's not something that's commonly practiced um, in, in, in our geography, but it depends, I suppose, where you are. I use this a lot, and, and Jean could, could tell because uh, he, he was with me uh, a while ago. Uh, Jean, uh, another question to you, and thank you, Manoj. Uh, another question to you. Uh, what to do with an asymptomatic patient, but with a lesion which is still clearly visible on X-ray? What will be your decision there? Uh, for that kind of patient, I think uh, we can just observe. I will not immobilize. Uh, I would stop um, uh, sports activities. Um, this would be the case to answer the first question uh, directed to me. Uh, patient, an asymptomatic patient, an incident finding, X-ray incident finding. Um, I think uh, the best option would be to uh, explain the family uh, what's the OCD physiopathology, and so we would stop um, sports and. Um, and the uh, impact uh, movements uh, and uh, uh, to the to the limb, running and uh, jumping. Thank you, Jean. I think here we, we have a, a very important question, uh, and I think uh, the key element here is that you should not discharge a patient, even thought he is asymptomatic with an abnormal X-ray because this is one of the characteristics of this uh, uh, peculiar disease. Uh, it can be latent um, maybe yes. uh, for, uh, for some years, and then uh, during uh, adulthood, uh, the uh, fragment uh, comes uh, loose, and it's, uh, it's much more difficult to, to handle. So I yes. think the key message here is that you should observe all the patient until they are healed, uh, both clinically and uh, on imaging as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, can I just add something? I just sure. give per, I just give uh, permission to uh, uh, sport uh, to do sports with no restriction after a complete healed X-ray image. Thank you very much for adding that. I think time flies. Uh, I will now conclude and thank warmly all the participants and all the speakers for the quality of their talks.
they all keep up with time uh, uh, and uh, i want to tell all the participants that uh, again they will uh, get uh, soon an evaluation form uh, together with a link uh, to get a, a replay i invi invite you all to the next epos webinar this one will be on clubfoot next month august the 31st thank you very much and good evening